folks don't worry about what makes the world go round. They just want to know what makes their wheels go faster. From the desert salt flats to the street at the foot of the driveway, get set to encounter three speed demons who just love to fly low. Jameson Durrett was only a kid when he dreamed of speeding around Owings Mills, Maryland in a motorcycle that was half indie racer. It was a dream not shared by dear old mom. All the time when I was growing up, my mother had told my brothers and I that if we ever got a motorcycle, she would take it apart with a sledgehammer. She, she was serious, and she found out, somehow she found out about my brother Mitch having a motorcycle, and she was on her way over. I swear, she was on her way over she was going to take it apart, or she was going to do something to it. So he got, a, got it out of the garage where he had it stored, and he got rid of it. Mama Durrett needn't have worried. She should have known that Jameson was safety conscious, and when she finally laid eyes on his souped-up Suzuki, she put away her sledgehammer for good. When I finished building the, the vehicle, I felt safe enough driving it not only because of the way I designed it, but also because evidently my mother approved of it. And if she was happy with it, then I figured it had to be fairly safe. Safe, not only because Jameson never intends to race his Indy cycle, but because this is a motorcycle with an extra wheel. And that's only the beginning. The Indy cycle has a chromoly frame with a fiberglass body on the top and a aluminum shell, or aluminum side panels on the sides. The front suspension uses a push rod right here to go to a rocker arm and then go to the shock absorbers. The wheels are exposed and according to both Maryland and Virginia state law, do not require fenders. It has disc brakes on all three wheels. Uh, they are adjustable with a proportioning valve and it, is, it weighs about 760 pounds. The steering wheel is removable to allow ease of entry the seat belt is a four-point pyrotech unit from a dragster. It has a very quick-release turnbuckle in the front. Everything's basically stock from here back, except for the bodywork. The bodywork I had to hand shape out of foam, and uh, it took a lot of work to get the curves and the shapes involved. Jameson did the work, but he called on the race car expertise of Rob Hamilton. And Jameson makes a point of checking in with Rob from time to time. I want to show you what I've done so far. The oh, I like the cool headlights. You like the headlights? Yeah, they're Pet cool. Pet boys, man. <laughs> 64 bucks. I bet you get some reactions with this, don't oh, you? Yeah. On the road? Are you kidding? I, if, if I'm on the road, I'm practically causing an accident. And if I'm parked anywhere, I pretty much draw a crowd. So it's uh, everybody's always, you know what the first question everybody asks me? Guess what the no first idea. question they ask me is? No idea. How fast does it go? How fast does it go? It goes the speed limit. Come on, Jameson. In second gear, it goes the speed limit. I guess some people get tattoos or get their ears, noses, lips, eyelids, whatever, pierced to show their individuality. And I guess my, I, I hopefully look like a fairly normal person, but I like to express my individuality, I guess, in a different way. Individuality is fine and dandy until one individual decides to hook up with another individual. We're talking love triangle here. Hi. I'm just looking at the indie cycle designs, how that seat would have really been uncomfortable sticking below the ground. I started right. building the indie cycle about the same time I met yeah. Dawn. And I was spending sometimes seven hours a night, three nights a week, working on it. And she knew that I was very focused on something. Uh, so I made sure she understood that, look, this is something very important to me. And I never wanted to have her make a decision between the two of them. We met in, um, I, th I guess it was the fall of 96, and he had started to build it. We got married in the fall of 99. So I was, I was to the point where it has to be done before the wedding was my reaction. Jameson told her about his other life. Then Dawn told him about hers. And she said, well, that's fair enough. Baseball is very important to me. And since you're doing, you have the indie cycle, and I'm going to have to learn and understand and deal with that, 
you're going to have to learn and understand and deal with my baseball. He had no clue about baseball. He never watched baseball, never even went to a game. So our deal was that I, um, I would learn about the vehicle and learn about the cool over shock, air adjustable shocks, and he would learn about baseball, and I would teach him, and he would know the players' names, and he would go to the games with me. So she learned about the Indy Cycle, and I learned every single member of the Orioles team, what position they played. Uh, it actually went well. I think, actually, he learned more about baseball than I learned about the Indy Cycle. But uh, I was very excited to actually see it completed. I was just amazed at how beautiful it was, all the very clean lines and the beautiful color red that it is. I just didn't expect it to be so pretty. Hey, you want me to push in some of the brush? Sure. OK, get it. What's next on Jameson's drawing board? Nothing with wheels on it. Not before the kitchen renovation is finished. Until then, I am not allowed to create or build any kind of mechanical monstrosity. However, one thing she did see was uh, something called the Grinnell Scorpion, which is a two-seater, three-wheeler, that she was like, this is fun. This is pretty cool. And she was pretty happy with that. So it's possible that I could build something like that in the future, but there's no guarantee. But guaranteed, the Indy Cycle will turn heads for years to come. This mile, two, five, seven, five, three, four. For some speed freaks, it isn't enough just to go fast. They need to go as fast as humanly possible. They need to fly without leaving the ground. For a challenge like that, it can't hurt to be a pilot, like Marlo Trite of Aurora, Oregon. Marlo's been running his automotive business out of the local airport for 25 years. But this is not an ordinary garage. Marlo builds engines that are one of a kind. We're, we're at the far end of the spectrum all the time. We start at the far end of the spectrum. If, you're sitting on, if you aren't sitting on the edge of the earth, you're taking up too much space. Marlow knows all about wide open spaces. He was born and raised on the Saskatchewan Prairie. And that's where, as a boy of 13, he learned to love motors from the engine block up. I love to build the parts. I love to envision the parts. I love to do the, uh, what I call uh, real-time engineering, which is build the part. If it breaks, build a better part. For me, it's a business, it's not a hobby. I've made my hobby my business or my business my hobby, I'm not sure which. It's a consuming, it's a consuming thing. He loves speed. From classic vehicles that look like they go fast to legendary ones that really do. We have the ultimate hot rod. We're looking at a MiG-21 and a few years ago, the Czech Republic was getting rid of their frontline airplanes. I have not had it flown yet. It's a single seat airplane and I have not uh, the training to fly it, but uh, I had intended to, but you know, good sense has got past me now. Marlo, you've got a gallery of speed machines here. Which one is your favorite? The one at Jim's. That would be the streamliner that Marlo calls Target 550. It's a work in progress that's taking shape in the machine shop of Jim Hume. Well, we're uh, building a race car here. We're going to try to be the first wheel-driven, piston-powered car to go over 500 miles an hour. And we, uh, Marlo Trite, the fellow that's uh, pushing the deal, is, uh, wants to go 550, so that's even better. And uh, the funny thing about it is that uh, the airplane record for piston-powered, propeller-driven airplane is 528, so if we go over that, then we'll be ahead of the airplane guys. He decided that he wanted to do the ultimate uh, farthest out thing he could do, and uh, this is it. The, you can't get any uh, more advanced than this unless you go to a jet engine. When will Target 550 be ready to roll? No rush. It's being handmade one piece at a time. Hey, you're early. It's not time for coffee yet. Well, I figured this is worth the coffee break. I think, right. I think maybe only 100 hours to make it. <laughs> it is the new throttle pedal. 
He's having too much fun with that mill. <laughs> That's great. I think it'll work. If it's going to work, it'll happen here at the Bonneville Salt Flats in Utah. Here's an earlier Marlow Trite speed machine, one of many he's owned and driven over 40 years of breaking land speed records. But these days, he's thinking outside the box. He's planning to turn the world of speed on its ear. They think fast is maybe 200 miles an hour. And with a current car, we don't shift it into high gear to 300, you know. You shift it out of low gear at 250, you shift it into third gear at, at uh, 300. And then you stand on the throttle and you go fast. And uh, so when we're talking about going 500, we're gonna exceed that. That's all there is to it. I think the car has every chance of succeeding in doing what it's supposed to do. I don't see any reason why it won't. And that's what you gotta look at. Why won't it do that? All four wheels are driven by both motors. We have these belt transfer boxes here. There's one behind each transmission, and they both drive into a common drive shaft that goes all the way down the side of the car. Up in front, there's a belt box that drives back over to the drive shaft which in turn drives the front wheels of the car. That's what drives it all right, but what stops it? Would you believe parachutes? There's four parachutes, and they're operated pneumatically with these pneumatic plungers, and these are operated from buttons on the steering wheel. And the first parachute is real small, because you don't want a large parachute at top speed. You'll pull the back of the car off or pull the parachute apart. So you start out with a real small one, and they get progressively larger as the car slows down. The car, it's about three feet square at the front, and it's 42 feet long, and it'll probably weigh upwards of 10,000 pounds. The 10,000 pounds sounds an awful heavy for a race car, but what you've got to realize is that anything traveling very fast is effectively lighter. Uh, it's affected by the wind more, by the track conditions more, and the tires are very smooth, so they don't, uh, come apart at high speeds. So the weight of the car helps to hold it down, uh, hold the traction down to the ground, and uh, keep the car from raising off the ground. So weight is not a factor. In fact, more weight is better in a project like this. More important than weight is shape. Every single cockpit panel on Target 550 is engineered by hand. There is no easy, quick, computerized way of doing this. You have to do this the way they made Suits of armor in the 14th century were made the same way. Only they were worked with hot iron. I'm using cold aluminum. It's easier to shape. But basically, I have to shape it the same way. I have to stretch it, shrink it, weld it, hammer it, and make it into a shape. And uh, that's the shape we arrived at on the model. And uh, that's it. Until they launch it, Marlow can only reminisce about his past successes and excesses. Uh, I've raced motorcycles at the Salt Flats. I've raced automobiles at the Salt Flats. I've driven sprint cars at a closed track, a dirt track car, as well as an asphalt car. And I've had a couple of incidents. I had a high-speed incident in the mid-'80s with a streamliner that uh, was you know, semi-catastrophic. Uh, I walked away from it with a black eye, and there was nothing left of the car. So now he wants to go faster. Marlow figures speed is relative. You aren't where you think you are, no matter who you are. Now, you're always, you can always just be sort of in a little bit of a fantasy land. And the further you're into the fantasy, and as long as you keep your feet on good, solid ground, the more fun you can have. Good luck to you, Marlo. We'll be watching with our fingers crossed. Zero to 60 in four seconds, courtesy John Whalen of Portland, Oregon. This is White Zombie. This is currently the world's quickest accelerating street legal electric vehicle. Does zero to 60 in about four seconds flat, maybe a little less. Best quarter mile time is 13.1 seconds, which is a little bit better than a brand new 375 horsepower Corvette. 
So um, this car was built to dispel the myth that electric cars are slow, dull, and boring, because it doesn't fit this car at all. Meet Godzilla. Godzilla is the world's most powerful electric motor controller for DC motors. Uh, we have two motors in here instead of the usual one. They're, they're an eight inch diameter motor, but there's two of them. And each motor can produce uh, 160 horsepower a piece. Each motor produces 270 foot pounds of torque. So it's kind of a potent package to say the least. And of course over here is the secret weapon. This is what we call the series parallel switcher. Because I have no transmission and I don't shift gears, but I'd like to be able to adjust things, I take off with the motors wired in series, kind of like flashlight batteries and a flashlight, so that all the current goes through both motors and you get maximum current and maximum torque, which is great for jumping out of the hole and beating that wimpy V8 next to you. Get about uh, halfway down the track and then it's time for more horsepower, so these relays switch it over to parallel wiring which doubles the voltage into both motors, which makes them go, whoa! John knows all about whoa. He's in the business, which means he knows electronics, big and small. Well, this is called Pee Wee the Twin Motor Mutated Muscle Scooter. You know, because it used to be a little innocent go-ped that, you know, you know, just kind of piddle around on with one motor and little batteries, but now it's got this drag racing battery, two motors, bigger wire. Oh, oh. We're all set here. I gotta just tighten it up with a wrench and we'll be ready to go. There's not much that John hasn't converted to battery power, but the satisfaction he feels doesn't only come from the joy ride. And what's cool about this electric stuff, there's no noise, there's no pollution, there's no greasy oil and stuff, and no smoke other than when the motor's catch on fire. So it's, uh, you're being environmentally correct while you're being a little insane at the same time. It works, I love it. Okay, you wanna try it out? Uh, maybe later, John. First, uh, a little bit more about you. Where did this electromania of yours come from? Uh, background, I was born a crazed individual. Now, I, um, according to my parents, when I was four years old, I was taking my dad's tools apart. Well, actually, it's very true because he still talks about it. He'd come, he was a carpenter, and he'd come home with a brand new skill saw, and then when he'd leave, I'd take it all apart, and I'd rewind the motors, and I'd make it go faster. It would either go faster or it'd burn up. That's kind of my motto still. It either goes fast or, or it burns up. You know, you start off with something relatively normal, and then you think, okay, if I add another battery, the motors don't catch on fire. We go really, really fast. That's what happened last time I took it out, and my wife caught me going down the road at an extreme rate of speed with flames coming off the motors, and she went, put it away, you're done with that one. So, that was that. John's wife, Sharon, keeps a close eye on him, for good reason. We're well known in every emergency room in town, so much so that one night I just very calmly said, you know, he wasn't hurt real bad, but I thought he ought to be looked at, and I got in the car, and uh, I said, well, which one would you like to go to tonight? Where haven't we visited recently? And uh, off we went. We get there, and we were not there more than 15 minutes, and in comes a guy behind the little curtains, and he goes, John, we haven't seen you in a while. We can make it better. Look, look, what do you think? Just take a few minutes. I think we need to try this, don't you? It's right there. All I have to do is wire tie that puppy, hook up one wire, and we're ready to go on 24 volts. I think we have to try this. Want to see it do a burn off? I can make it smoke the tire. Ready? Ah! Did you get that one? Oh yeah, we got it. And we're getting this on film too. Here's hoping Sharon isn't watching Weird Wheels right now. Woo! Oh yeah, I got a little stable there on me. I had to get out of it. Easy, big boy. You're pushing 40. Hit. Not miles per hour, years old. 40. Yeah. It started wobbling on me. I had to get out of it. I, I, was, I thought of my hamburger kneecaps. I thought, nah, better, better get out of it. It, it was still accelerating. <sighs> no, that's a little too much. I think I better wear some knee pads and some leathers next time, you know? Remember, don't tell my wife. A grown man goofing around with scooters? Case of arrested <laughs> development? 
Actually, a case of environmental awareness. About seven years old, standing in the driveway, waving bye to mommy and daddy as they left in the family car, and it blew smoke all over me and, and pollution, my eyes burnt. And even at that age, I went, this isn't right. You know, this, this stuff is going into the air and it, and it stinks, it can't be good for us. Went inside, played with my little battery powered toys, and went, someday big cars will run on batteries. And it, 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 it was the planted the seed, and that was it. You know, I've never been the same since. Don't go away. John Whalen's electrical lessons aren't over yet. Not one vehicle in John Whalen's fleet ever stops at a gas pump. People ever ask you about that, John? One of the things that is a pet peeve of mine when you talk to people about electric cars is don't you have to plug it in? Like, that's really a big deal. You know, you know, it's really, really tough. And I always tell them, you know, I think it's a much bigger deal to pay some slob to pour gas all over the side of your car and get up out of your house and drive and put that, you know, pollution belching stuff in there. This is how tough it is. Ready? Now, this is what everybody's afraid of. Watch how hard this is. Don't you have to plug it in? Oh, yeah, it's, it's just awful. I mean, this is really tough to do. OK, let's see. Oh, man, that was tough, wasn't it? What's cool about an electric car, you plug it in before you go to bed, and you wake up in the morning, and somehow magic fairies came in the night and put electricity back in your car. It's magically all filled up, ready to go. It's like, oh, this is like magic. So, you know, it's kind of cool. <laughs> While one car is taking on juice, John can hop aboard another. OK, so some of them don't go too fast, but with a 144-watt sound system, who cares? Speed Freaks, from Jameson Durrett on his Indy Cycle, to Marlo Trite driving into the record books, to John Wayland on his mini but muscular motor scooter, all trying to quench the need for speed. I'm a 21st century 